today, I just wanted to get into some of the key points related to the paper, um, which are important to note. So uh, one of the first key points I think is important to highlight is that uh, the historical Tunisian logistical and facilitation networks related to the Iraq Jihad, meaning the mobilization that went to Iraq from 2003 to 2009, um, provided easy connection to Syria in the more recent years from 2011-12 onwards. Um, so in terms of Iraq specifically, the first group of known foreign fighters to actually go to Iraq came in the fall of 2002. These were a group of Tunisians that were living in Marseille, France, as well as some Iraqis that were living in uh, France that went to Kurdistan right on the uh, border with Iran, where Zarqawi at the time was building himself up before the U.S. even uh, invaded yet, uh, which would happen about six months later. It's also important to note this because uh, the history of what was going on in Iraq laid the seeds for many of the activities that we saw in Tunisia afterwards. So for example, Hassan Brick, who was the head of Dawa or proselytization or outreach efforts for Ansar al-Sharia in Tunisia after the Tunisian revolution in 2011, actually helped out with a safe house in Syria, moving fighters from Syria into Iraq last decade. So you can see how these connections made the last decade became important more recently. And additionally, um, if you look at some of the key recruitment and facilitation networks last decade, there's an important individual named Abu Umar al-Tunisi. Um, we didn't really know who this guy was for many years. It only became known more recently in the last like two or three years that this guy was Tariq al-Harzi. Um, he was an important individual within the efforts of Zarqawi's network, but then later the Islamic State of Iraq, and then ISIS, and of course IS, um, for recruiting foreign fighters to Iraq, and then later Syria. What's interesting to note, though, is that his brother Ali al-Harzi, who was in Iraq last decade too, also ended up helping out with the recruitment related to this as well. Um, but he did it from Libya after 2011, and he was actually one of the inv individuals involved in the consulate attack in Benghazi. Um, and besides that, he trained individuals, especially Tunisians, that then went on to Syria. Um, so related to this then is sort of AST or Ansar al-Sharia's sanctioning and incubation of foreign fighting in Tunisia after the 2011 revolution. Um, so before Syria became sort of the jihad du jour, um, they were still recruiting people to Iraq prior to Syria really bubbling up. Um, just to note this, the leader of AST, Abu Ayyad al-Tunisi, um, in a de December 2011 interview uh, noted that, quote, if you come to me and say, quote, I want to go to Iraq, he said, I will not prevent you because if I do, I will be sinful because you want to realize one of the obligations, which is supporting Muslims and fighting the enemies of our religion. This excitement for jihad and Tunisians' involvement in it did not wane over time, of course. In February 2013, Abu Ayyad, in a different interview, noted um, that Tunisians could be found everywhere in the land of jihad. The ways of going are easy, um, and we do not stop anyone from leaving. Um, so as you can see, even though the group was based in Tunisia and it was focused on proselytizing and they weren't really that violent in Tunisia at the time, they still had connections and efforts as it related to what was going on abroad, whether it was to Iraq and Syria or even to Libya next door. In addition, their official Facebook page at the time was promoting the Syrian Jihad, as well as Tunisians that went over there and died as martyrs. So this is a way to incite other individuals to potentially go so that they could be glamorized in the same fashion. Um, and one last thing to note that is important is a key recruiter within Tunisia, Bilal Kouachi. Um, he was a key individual on the streets of Tunisia who was going to people and helping sort of radicalize them to then decide to go on to Syria eventually. And additionally, at the time, uh, from 2011 to end of 2013, he also had the opportunity to go on television shows at night during prime time and have debates with different individuals. It's important to contextualize that in this period, in the first two years after the revolution, that jihadis were allowed to openly uh, operate without too much harassment due to the way the government was uh, dealing with them since they felt that it was better to dialogue with them than to crack down upon them. That being said, as they gained strength over time, the government uh, you know, wasn't too happy about this because it became a larger threat to their own power base. Um, so starting with the crackdown of AST in the spring of 2013, which then culminated in the group's terrorist designation in August 2013 by the Tunisian government, 
This led to an even early flow of foreign fighters, which coincided with the Islamic State of Iraq, which is what the group was calling itself at the time, when it went into Syria and became ISIS in April 2013. So in terms of uh, the numbers specifically, there's been a lot of complications related to, you've heard numbers like 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, what have you. Um, it doesn't really make sense, and the Tunisian government also never really stated this for whatever reason. Other people mention this in media reports, but based off of the data that I've gathered, as well as reports by the Tunisian government more recently, um, it tracks more that a, a little more than 2,900 or so individuals actually went. That doesn't necessarily mean, though, that the mobilization wasn't um, large. Um, they stopped about 27,000 people between 2012 and about 2017. So there was still a large amount of people that wanted to go. They just weren't allowed to go. Um, what's interesting, though, about this mobilization is that everybody, of course, talks about the announcement of IS's caliphate in June 2014 and how that spurned a large group of people to go to Syria in particular, but also Iraq um, as well. But what's interesting when you look at the data and sort of the trajectory of this mobilization, at least for the Tunisians specifically, is that mo most Tunisians who mobilized to join groups in Iraq and Syria did so between March 2013 and June 2014. This date range, of course, is perhaps surprising given the fact that ISIS's caliphate announcement was in June, as I mentioned. A number of <coughs> factors can explain uh, the surge in this period and not later. The heightened showdown between AST and the Tunisian government in the spring of 2013. Um, the April 2013 announcement of ISIS, as it was known then, going into Syria, um, it was just as motivating as the caliphate announcement was to many of the Tunisians. And the Tunisians that had already been in Syria at that juncture who were fighting with Jabhat al-Nusra, which was more aligned with al-Qaeda in later years, um, ended up defecting and switching to ISIS. Um, in addition, uh, at that point, the Tunisian government really hadn't started to crack down harshly against the efforts of people going abroad to fight. And then in terms of the later time period, what's interesting is that you saw the rise of the Libyan theater next door, whereby in the spring and summer of 2014, IS was already sending Tunisian operatives who had been in Syria to build up its infrastructure in Libya ahead of its official announcement in November 2014 that the group there was part of IS and that they're expanding their provinces beyond Iraq and Syria to Libya as well as um, other countries as well. Um, and this is just a slide to show some of the data in relation to it. You can get into it more, but you could see that at least based off of the earliest data, um, they started mobilizing in around April 2012. Um, and the most recent data that the Tunisian government really put out was in December 2016. Um, so it's possible that the numbers have gone up, but based off of what we know related to the overall mobilization, not too much has changed. Um, but you could see that the number of people that have been stopped went up a lot over time um, uh, between 2013 and 17. Um, and then we've seen that people up to about 550, at least that's you can look at online and find data about it, have died, um, though it's likely more. And then about 970 individuals have returned back to Tunisia um, as of uh, March this year. Um, so uh, one of the things to also note is that uh, this is a national phenomenon. If you look at the foreign fighter mobilization from some countries, you might see people specifically from one city or one neighborhood or maybe two or three villages or have you. But if you look at the case of Tunisia, these people are coming from a lot of different parts of the country. Um, of course, there's a great glut of people in the Bezert region, in the Tunis region, in the central part in Sousse and Monastir. Um, uh, but as you can tell, it's been touched by a lot of parts of the country and it's not just um, something that can be dealt with in one area and sort of quarantine it in some ways. It needs to have local solutions in all these locations because the reasons people are going is different depending on their own background or situation personally. Um, in addition to this, uh, it's important to note, uh, looking at the data related to those who died in uh, Syria in particular, 
um, that you could tell that more Tunisians ended up fighting with ISIS, which isn't surprising. Um, uh, these are the totals, at least based off of open data r related to it. And what's interesting when you look at the data, and this map is uh, where Tunisians died in Syria, um, uh, is that the number of people that died with Jabhat al-Nusra is a lot larger than the number of people that died with their successor organizations, Jabhat Fatah al-Sham or Hayat Tahrir al-Sham, which further illustrates that many of the Tunisians that had originally been with Nusra and their group ended up going to ISIS since the later groups that Nusra became, not that many Tunisians died with them. Um, so uh, besides uh, the numbers aspects of this, it's important to look at sort of what are the motivations behind why people are going. This isn't an easy issue. Humans are complicated, as we know, in our own personal lives. Um, I'm obviously not going to go through every single one in uh, lots of detail, but it's important to note that uh, some of the main ones included altruism, anti-colonialism, a bandwagon effect, disillusionment with the Tunisian post-revolution political stage, pursuit of economic opportunities, the establishment of the caliphate, impressionability of young guys trying to fit in, um, open conditions, which, which we discussed related to Ansar al-Sharia, um, sort of personal tragedy in somebody's life, prison radicalization, recidivism amongst people from a prior generation, desire for redemption, a sense of religious void, as well as um, sectarianism. I'm just only going to get into two or three of these um, just to illustrate some points. So one of them I think that's really important and is interesting is the idea of disillusionment sort of with the politics of Tunisia after the revolution. Many Tunisians had great hopes following the fall of the government of President Ben Ali um, in 2011. These were especially prevalent among highly educated youth, um, but they're experiencing uh, high levels of unemployment, possibly up to 50 percent. Yet despite gradual political process over the past seven years, the economic fruits that so many have yearned for have yet to emerge. Um, as a consequence, many young people have become steadily disillusioned with the political process um, within Tunisia. Um, and they believe many of the elites have only benefited. Um, in turn, Tunisians sought alternative pathways to economic success, or at the very least pursue, pursuing significant outside of a system that still marginalized a lot of young individuals. One way was through migration to Europe and pursuing more abundant opportunities there, while others sought relief within the jihadist movement with, it, with its sense of mission, infusion of pride, um, and immediate social benefits. It did not hurt that groups like AST and later IS were just then rising and promoting a new form of governance that called for skilled youth to carry out their program, which sought ostensibly to improve society just under a theocratic rather than a democratic rubric. Tunisia's first president after the revolution, Monsef Marzouki, summed up this dilemma well when he said, quote, we had a dream. Our dream was called the Arab Spring, and our dream is now turning into a nightmare. But the young people need a dream, and the only dream available to them now is the caliphate." End quote. A young Tunisian filmmaker whose cousin was then fighting in Syria confirmed this sentiment um, when asked whether joining IS seemed normal to them. He said, quote, if you lived in Tunisia and you're experiencing daily subjugation and injustice and you have ideas and you have principles and you have objectives and you have a vision for the future and if you live in a state that doesn't embrace you, then it's the opposite. It's very normal. Uh, so in terms of another reason people went, of course, is not surprisingly the establishment of the caliphate. Um, when IS announced it had reestablished the caliphate, the news was greeted by supporters um, greatly. Of course, that didn't carry much legitimacy within the broader Muslim community, um, but some saw a new opportunity for justice where Muslims were once again on top instead of being bullied through colonialism or disregarded by their local Arab secular, military, or monarchical authoritarian systems. This is why a Tunisian named Ahmed, for example, supported IS. He said, the Islamic State is a true caliphate, a system that is fair and just, where you don't have to follow somebody's orders because he is rich or powerful. It is action, not theory, and it will topple the whole game. Likewise, Ridda from Jenduba, who traveled to Syria in 2013, said he wanted to join IS because he was attracted by the radical ideology and was convinced that he would be on the front lines of defending his faith and bringing Sharia to the masses. Um, Additionally, you had Um Fatima, a Tunisian who contested the idea that women join IS for jihad al nikah or a euphemism for sex jihad or providing comfort to fighters, a notion that was propagated by the Tunisian government as disinformation against this movement. 
undoubtedly IS engaged in sexual abuse, um, but no credible evidence has emerged to suggest that women who joined IS um, did so to comfort fighters. Um, for her part, the Tunisian Khadija Omri said that she went to Syria with her husband in hope of, quote, uh, leading the kind of religious lifestyle they had long dreamt of. It was for jihad, for Sharia and the Islamic State. I really believed that there was a state where we could live like the Prophet, end quote. Similarly, Umm Bara al-Tunisi, a former IS member, she said she came to Syria as a woman wanting to be empowered by Islamic principles. And then finally, uh, the last motivation that I'm going to discuss is the idea of redemption. Um, so uh, according to Ahmed, who is a former IS adheritant, um, after his brother Rashid went to Syria, he saw online that this was a means for recruitment. He explained that, quote, the jihadi recipe begins simmering in the minds of young men when they confess past sins to their clerics. Sins that mainly revolve around dating a girl, drinking alcohol, or frequently uh, frequenting bars. The cleric then begins to exaggerate the seriousness of those sins, transforming them into unpardonable offenses um, that the young man must atone for through certain deeds, the culmination of which is to fight the jihad in Syria. Um, next, besides the motivational aspects, it's important to look at sort of what these Tunisians actually did once they got to Syria itself and Iraq to a lesser extent. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the different roles that they um, looked at. And on this slide here, um, you could see the, some of the roles that are known publicly. Um, and again, you could go online to the report and look at this a lot easier, since I'm sure the text is kind of small um, on the screen. Um, so uh, some of the roles included two Tunisians who were involved in the torture and execution of the captured Jordanian pilot, Muaz Kasaspe. Um, Abu Bilal al-Tunisi was at the scene of Kasaspe's capture and was pictured with his arm around the lieutenant's neck. Following this capture, Um Rayan al-Tunisi, who will be discussed a little bit later as well, participated in Kasaspe's torture. Uh, according to a female Tunisian IS member who later defected from the group, um, she said, quote, it was the most brutal torture I've ever seen. Besides these bloody episodes, though, many Tunisians were engaged in outreach and religious education as part of the IS state-building project. One individual so engaged early on was Abu Akas al-Tunisi, who became the face of what was then IS's DAWA program and appearing in six of its videos by the end of 2013. This is an important and underappreciated dynamic um, because, as we saw within Tunisia earlier, they were primarily involved in outreach and governance um, and not so much violence. So when Tunisians were able to go then to Syria and join up with IS and continue this type of work, it very much tracked with what they were doing already. So there wasn't too much of a difference. It was only a difference in name of group necessarily. For their part though, uh, Tunisian women helped shape the vision of IS as society. The founder of the group's infamous Al Khansa Brigade, which began operating in February 2014, was a Tunisian woman named Um Rayan, who I just mentioned was involved in the torture of the Jordanian pilot. She would also help establish the Al Khansa Brigade in Libya after IS took control of CERT and then moving there from Syria in September 2015. Um, what she did immediate when she, uh, when she did when she instituted this brigade was stationing women at checkpoints to make sure those under the niqab were not men disguised for an ambush, securing marriages for foreigners who joined IS, standardizing displays for women's clothes and mannequins in stores, replacing all male OBGYN doctors with women, and helping develop school curricula for girls. Amongst the women who joined this brigade was Um Hajar al-Tunisi, who was responsible for Sharia classes and helped recruit women for the groups Diwan al-Ta'alim, or the Administration of Education, and Diwan al-Siha, or the Administration of Health, for an estimated monthly salary of $100 to $200. There's also the case of Um Abdurrahman al-Tunisi, who helped facilitate arranged marriages in al Mayadeen, Syria, which is in Deir Ezzor province. Alongside these positions, um, the notes within the Islamic State's border documents uh, remark on specific skills of interest to the group. Um, for instance, there's Kaka al-Tunisi, who was trained in street fighting and kung fu, Abu Musa al-Tunisi, who had experience in transferring money and importing goods, Abu Saad al-Tunisi, who worked as a smuggler in Libya and Algeria, Abu Yusuf al-Tunisi, who knew 
some type of software privacy uh, programs and Abu Mujahid al-Tunisi, who was an expert in hacking encrypted websites, allegedly. This shows how the border documents were used not only to identify individuals that were joining the group, but also to spot potential talent that could be used for them going forward. Um, that being said, uh, not everything went right with IS and the recruits going forward. Um, as I noted, about 970 individuals have since returned uh, to Tunisia um, uh, from Iraq and Syria. Um, part of this is due to the issue of disillusionment again, um, but in the context of disillusionment with ISIS and what they're doing. Um, for example, uh, Sharf Adina Hasni, an ISIS supporter, remained in Tunisia but had multiple friends who traveled to Syria, noted from his interactions with them that they, quote, uh, thought it would be like joining the side of the Prophet Muhammad, but they found it was divided into these small groups with a lot of transgressions they did not expect, like forcing people to fight between Jabhat al-Nusra and the Islamic State. Furthermore, an aspiring combatant named uh, Ghaith, who returned to Tunisia, said, it was totally different from what they said jihad would be like. It's not a revolution or jihad, it's a slaughter. Moreover, Faisal explains that between the image they give themselves in their videos on the internet, that of the companions of the prophet, and what they really are, cold and calculating, there is a gap, end quote. That being said, there are challenges related to this. Some of these expressions of disenchantment might not be wholly genuine instead reflecting an acknowledgment of the Islamic State's loss of territory. For example, after IS began ceding ground, someone like Anwar Bayoud evidently began to see IS members as monsters. Yet, for whatever reason, he and others like him did not express such sentiments when the group was riding high and everything was promising. Similarly, Muhammad Amruni, after IS began losing Raqqa, began to reach out to his family about returning home. His brother Ajmi said that he, quote, begged for my forgiveness. This is part of the dilemma with returning foreign fighters writ large, not just in Tunisia. Determining whether their remorse is genuine, express disillusion with the IS experience, but, peer, uh, but paired with the hesita hesitancy to disavow the broader ideology and a focus on poor implementation prevents a special conjury. Once home, returnees also face the stigma of having joined a jihadist group, now wearing a proverbial scarlet letter. A former combatant named Rajab concurs that, quote, even the ones that express regret are outcast and marginalized by society. Therefore, because these returnees have no alternative social network in Tunisia, they risk relapsing out of the desire for solidarity and purpose that fomented their mobilization to join in the first place. In some sense, this is why Ajmi Amruni's expression in reference to his brother Muhammad, who is seeking to re return home via extradition from the SDF camps in Syria, uh, said, quote, inshallah, he is not a threat. This encapsulates the approach taken by Tunisia as well as other governments um, it, with the dilemma. Tunis in particular is essentially hoping that everything just works out because at this juncture it offers no governmental level rehabilitation or reintegration initiatives for individuals who fought in Syria with some returnees either out in societies while others are detained in prison. This is why the future of the movement, as I note in the slide, is brewing within the prison system right now, which includes not just the returnees from Syria or even the returnees from Libya, which is beyond this particular presentation, but also those that have been arrested locally, domestically, um, for jihadi online activity, fundraising, um, or attack plotting. It is no doubt a challenge, but the fact that Tunisia is a democracy provides it an advantage that others in the Arab world might not have since it can involve its robust civil society and not necessarily rely on a purely securitized approach. Whether it is successful remains to be seen, of course, um, but based on all of this information, it is not surprising and it's easy to see why individuals in the Tunisian government, as well as in Western Europe and the United States, remain worried about what can become of the future of this movement, since there are so many that have returned, so many that wanted to go that were stopped, and so many that are interacting with each other now within the prison system, and there are rumors of sort of mini emirates, so-called, being created within this prison system. What that means going forward is hard to know, um, of course, since it's hard to access if you're not within the Tunisian security establishment to interview or talk to these people. Um, but as we saw last decade, um, starting in 2006 to 2011, when Tunisian jihadists were planning at the time for what they would do once they were released from prison, 
that eventually led to what became Ansar al-Sharia in Tunisia, which then led to everything that I've talked about today. So we can see how this prison population is very important to understand and see what's going on. But unfortunately, there is a gap in our information right now, and that's why it's important to focus on this issue, even if the foreign fighter mobilization specifically to Syria no longer is as relevant as it was three, four, five years ago, and so many people have returned home. So I'll leave it at that for now, and thank you for your time. I look forward to your questions. Thanks.